So I will start my presentation on species and speciation in cyanobacteria with a little outline. I would like to take you for a journey which took 3 billion years, maybe even more, and what we see today in the cyanobacterial diversity. I would like to start in the deep past with some macroevolutionary patterns which took hundreds of millions of years and then continue with uh, patterns which we can see today and which happened quite recently in millions of years. And I will finish up the whole presentation about how I view the species and how we can delimit the species using some probabilistic tools. And the whole presentation will somehow also entangle with some uh, taxonomic questions because the evolution of cyanobacteria and the patterns which leads to the species which we see today is also projected in a taxonomic decision which we make. Yeah, I have to start actually with cyanobacteria and some important things which I will stress then uh, later. We like to call cyanobacteria the only organisms with oxygenic photosynthesis and very important part of their diversity is that they do have a lot of morphological variability. So we can observe thousands of morphotypes. So algae base, for example, contains more than 5,000 species and the people think that they could be morphologically distinguished. But as we see in molecular studies, show a little different picture than that. And I just put here a recent phylogeny. Uh, we can see that there are also non-photosynthetic neighbors of cyanobacteria. And one of those oldest estimates of their origins is 3. billion years ago. So this group is so ancient and so interesting. That's why we all look at it. I jump back a little bit into the morphology. I just want to stress some things which I will talk about later. So uh, it's kind of unique among uh, prokaryotes that we see so many morphotypes. Looking at those pictures, you see there are so many shapes and colors in cyanobacteria. So we see like three basic morphologies. So it's like a unicellular cyanobacteria, like they are solitary or packed into some kind of colonies. And then there are filamentous cyanobacteria, which form chains of cells. And then the, like the most advanced cyanobacteria even have cell differentiation in enterocytes and uh, acne. So we will get to this fact of filamentous and unicellular cyanobacteria a lot, as you will see later on slides. I want to stress out one more thing, and that the cyanobacteria evolution was supposed to be very, very, very slow. This is called hypobradytally, if I pronounce it correctly. The theory is that since we see fossil cyanobacteria, which are here on the right panel, very similar to those modern ones. So it was proposed they don't actually change. Later on, with the beginning of tree building and uh, the phylogenetics in cyanobacteria, this was kind of confirmed, but you know, there was very little data. Just look at the tree, just microcystis, planktotris, taikuni, micro, like several cyanobacteria general, which are very distinct. But when we add much more data, you'll see that it is very, very, very different. Now there are two questions. So do phylogenetic relationships follow the morphological similarity? And in the other words, the morphology is similar. Cyanobacteria should be more closely related, right? But that doesn't actually work. We observe a lot of convergent evolutionary events in the evolution of cyanobacteria. I put here an example of cyanococcus. We work on that some time ago and just took all the cyanococcus and all sorts of cyanobacteria from the gene bank and make the 16S RNA tree. And also we made a genome tree, but that wasn't that, uh, the signal wasn't that strong in there because the taxon sampling is much lower. Here you see like yellow arrows and each arrow points to one lineage of cyanococcus. The blue stripe here is great oxygenation event. So you can see that most of the big clades actually diverged before that. So like we got here more than two and a half million years of evolution. In that time, we see at least 12 cyanococcus lineages. We already know that there is more of them. And so in between those lineages, there are all sorts of filament, those cyanobacteria. So we see in each clade reoccurring evolution of unicellular to filamentose. And then again, just there are some lineages which are unicellular, that is cyanococcus and then filamentos. So this has been happening for many, many millions of years. So what does it mean? You know, like all the cyanobacteria, this is the picture, this is how it looks like, just simple cell, just reappeared 12 times, but we cannot call them all cyanococcus, right? Because the common ancestry is like 3 billion years. It's so far away in the past that it is really hard to call something which diverged so long time ago with the same name. So there is a, actually one more note before I get to the answer to the question and what, what this is supposed to mean. 
So that the same thing was suggested for sulfur bacteria, because they are also very similar in the fossil and in the present sample. And then for that, we propose that we can see serial convergence. Then those authors from that paper replied to us that they actually see again the evolutionary stasis. So it was just kind of nice uh, argument over, over letters in PNAS. What is the taxonomic outcome of these convergent evolutionary events? So we see that most of the traditional genera are polyphyletic. And so now it has been like boom of genera. I think that Jeff actually talked about it a lot, so I will not really jump into that a lot. I just uh, highlighted here those which we named in those five years. And this is just a glimpse to what is the real situation, right? Because there is more than 100 new genera. So there are also other things which are involved in the fact that no more than 21% of taxons are correctly named in the gene bank, but also this convergence of morphologies must be very strong driver of that. So what we did in this small experiment just took all the cyanobacteria 16 RNA and made the phylogeny. And then we delimited species using a phylogenetic species concept. I will not go into details, it just needs to be stressed that a gene bank is full of very, very similar sequences. And if they are like all the same, they can be considered as one species. So we had to clump them into some kind of clades. I would say putative species. And then we try to say if those putative species actually correspond to some existing species. So we have at least two databases. One is called CyanoDBM, one is LGBase. I mentioned uh, that before. Uh, there is like between two and a half. And actually, this is uh, old figure. So there is now more than 5,000 species. But anyway, we found overlap only in 21% of those. So it is really the thing that in Chimpang, it is very, very hard to find correctly identified sequences. So now we'll jump to in the recent events. Looking at the speciation, and this is general for all microbes, there are like hundreds and millions, maybe billions of species, and the evolution is driven by all sorts of factors, like mutation selection and uh, recombination, and they can all act with or without geographical barrier. So uh, in microbes, this question about geographical barrier can be different to, to those in uh, plants and animals, but I will get to that in to detail later, but here I want to explain four scenarios which we could observe. So here on the x-axis, we could see that there is like a growing ecological selection. So those scenarios at the bottom have uh, one has low ecological selection and the other has high and then the recombination. And the bottom is low and in this scenario A, it is much higher. So the interplay of these two can make the species diverge, you know, to speciate. So we can observe either in the A that there is uh, some genetic incompatibility. They would say sexual isolation locus. So this is in general. So it's hard maybe to imagine that in prokaryotes, but there is a restricted gene flow, let's say. And there is no selection. In the scenario B, we have actually a very significant selection at some locus, but there is still a lot of recombination. In the scenario C, we see a geographical barrier. So there is no recombination and there is no selection. And the last scenario is a lot of selection at some locus with geographical differentiation. So there are all those factors play a significant role. So I will, I will jump back to microbes, where the sympatric speciation was suspected to be the default mode of speciation because they have large population sizes and diversity and extensive dispersal. So they can just fly everywhere. So and it was summarized under this famous tenet of bus backing, as everything is everywhere, but the environment selects. And uh, later, Finley somehow like generalized that for all organisms, more than uh, one millimeter. But that's uh, that was just using the morphological approach. Looking at the genomes, and now I will talk particularly about uh, the prokaryotes, we can see that it is actually a matter of marker sensitivity because most of the groups would probably show some kind of geographical differentiation, but the distance would matter how far away they can travel. So if I explain to these like messy pictures, it's actually quite easy to understand, but it's a lot of dots and lines. So I will walk you through it. So at the X axis, we can see nucleotide divergence of the genomes in percent. So there is like five, 10 or 15% of difference. On the y-axis, there is geographical distance. So if we look at the human pathogen, that's the panel A, we can see that even like super far away localities, 20,000 kilometers 
are basically very, very similar. There is just 0.014 differentiation between those genomes. So we would really have to like deeply sample. If you look at the panel F, that's the complete opposite. So we could see localities which are 7,000 kilometers apart, and there is 5% difference in the genome. So they would even be considered as a different species by the prokaryotic species concept. So like in terrestrial legs, we see similar pattern that they are actually differentiated. And just for an interesting fun fact that the cyanobacteria, by the estimates in this study, diffuse one square kilometer per year, you know? So this is pretty fast, right? Uh, so well, it's an average. So there are some groups which are faster and some slower. Now I will talk about the uh, microcos vaginatus. So that's why I started those terrestrial things. Because that this cyanobacterium is cosmopolitan and we chose it as a model to study evolution for several reasons. Because it's a very important primary producer in all sorts of places. And drylands are 40% of the Earth's surface. And this area actually grows. One other thing, it's uh, adapted to the wide temperature ranges and low humidity. Looks like this, it's a filament, it has a nice sheath, and also calyptra, which allows it to bore into the soil. So then we studied 500 strains from all sorts of places around the world. And we first sequenced 16 RNA and ATS and made a tree. And we found out that there are 13 clades. And within these clades, we saw geographical differentiation. Just for example, here, if you focus on this clade 11, we could see that there are Antarctic, European, and Australian, and then some other European clade. So what we could see that this is not one species. It, it has been suggested it is more species, but it seems to be much more complex than expected. And at the same time, we see significant correlation between geogenetic and geographical distance. So which suggests also the isolation by distance. So so for now, we do have more than 200 genomes, but here I show just 150, and I couldn't concatenate more than 1600 genes just to produce this phylogenomic tree. We see about the 10 clusters. I mean, it will be decided in the future. We need much more evidence, but for now, we just call them some clusters because we just uh, want to see some evolutionary patterns. The question here was also when these events of diversification happen. Uh, years ago, I estimated mutation rate in the 16S RNA from uh, gypsum crystals, which allow me to make this uh, chronogram. So you can basically see how these uh, lineages in microclose were diverging between two and a half and five million years ago. So it is a quite recent group, considering the, the fact that evolution of cyanobacteria was supposed to be super slow in billions of years, but here we can easily see that it happened like over several millions of years, which is similar to other eukaryotes, even animals and plants. So we saw that the, the geography plays a role, but what about the climate? We took uh, bioclimatic variables from the database WorldClim and try to test if they show a phylogenetic signal. So it basically means if more closely related samples have more similar climatic variables around, if they are from the places where the climate is the same. And we used several measures like Pegas Lambda, Abu C mean, and Moran's I. And all tests were significant. And here I just showed that some of the variables were autocorrelated, so we removed them. Everything is uh, in the recent paper of my student, Alexander, who was responsible for uh, this part. So the climate drives the diversification. Now, what about the gene flow? So in the scheme, I showed that there may be gene flow recombination playing some role here. So uh, I just need to now introduce a little bit on the homologous recombination and non-homologous recombination of how do I define them and what we see. So in homologous recombination, small fragments are transferred between the genomes and there must be very high similarity. It could be only small differences because otherwise the rec A enzyme doesn't work. In non homologous recombination, it is more probably known as horizontal gene transfer. The whole piece or some fragment of foreign DNA is incorporated into the genome. And, you know, we see both in prokaryotes, and there is a lot of genomic evidence for that. Not that much of experimental evidence, but I think that will come up. Another thing I have to stress is that what the prokaryotes and eukaryotes have in common, that is kind of sexual reproduction. So in plants and animals, we see real sexual reproduction, but the sexual reproduction is imprinted into the genome due to recombination. And we see recombination in prokaryotes. So sometimes some people call prokaryotes quasi-sexual because of the recombination. I showed you three with the genomes and microcolos. Here I show you each gene tree. 
So the blue line is a species tree. So that's what we would call the species, what kind of relationship they have. And then each green line is some tree from a specific gene. And so we see, for example, here that the topology of the tree is branching like this, but then there are like many green lines which shows topology different from the species tree. That suggests that could be some kind of gene flow. And what we see across the evolution of micropelos, so this is a case where we see not that many differences, but in cases, it's many differences. You don't even see the actual species tree is just some kind of average of something, which I'm not sure if makes actually any sense. We would always see such entanglement, but we just need to put a numbers on it. So we want to quantify the recombination or the horizontal gene transfer in a specific number. So what is the most plausible scenario for the micropolos? We see a lot of gene flow and there seems to be some ecological factor playing a role. So I guess that for now we can say that the scenario B is the most plausible, what we see here in this cyanobacterial genus. Yeah, and now for uh, something completely different. The butterflies. Now we were just saying, you know, what the heck is he doing? But our concept can be applied to any organisms. So I chose an example of a Heliconus butterflies. So they are in the South and Central America and they are really beautiful. So many nice colors on the wings. And they do have very similar pattern evolution as I showed before in microcos, right? You can see that there is like some kind of blue species tree and then there are some kind of red lines. We had green lines before and the topology doesn't correspond. So that suggests some kind of gene flow. And so they actually did quantify it here and also for the past. So what they saw is that in the past, 30% of the genome transferred between lineages and in the present, 4.4%. So it gets lower. So we also could see basically like a different topology. And that is very similar, as I said, to cyanobacteria. So it means that the speciation organisms is very often, or maybe in most of them in gene flow. I just put there here examples of all sorts of organisms where we observe speciation and gene flow at the same time. So it's the same, again, the scenario B. How is it projected into the taxonomy or how we can work with the species? So I should start with some uh, little introductions to some definitions. And so the species concept, we usually take as some kind of a framework for a species definition, and then we could have species definition based on morphology or genetics. It is species and species concept that is really essential thing for communication research and very often also for conservation of species. And the main goal of our species concept was usually just to make it as close to nature as possible. Then the species definitions, they could be more or less affected by the methods we have, but those concepts should be transferable and as close to nature as possible, as I said. Very important thing is that those species concepts are discrete. It cannot be anything in between. We have a 35 species concept just put for, I think, the most common. It's a phonetic species concept that's basically, you know, from the ancient Greece when they started to think about that and more similar morphological things, they see that they are basically the same species. In biological species concept, we are looking for intermarrying individuals. It can be also applied to the prokaryotes, right? Because they are also interconnected by the recombination as all the plant animals and plants. And most use concept, at least in cyanobacteria, is phylogenetic species concept, where irreducible group whose members are descended from the common ancestor and who all possess a combination of some kind of traits, which allows them to be identified. I mean, sometimes it's also monophyletic and it's like a whole group of concepts. My personal favorite is subjective species concept, it actually is among those 35. And this is basically what you consider as a species. And there I think actually phylogenetic is supposed to be most common, but it seems to me often that the subjective species concept is the most common. The speciation is continuum, but the species are defined as discrete units. So what do we do with that? So let me introduce you a little bit into the thing which we call genetic space. So in this very simple example, we have two lineages in the genetic space. Then there is a layer, each layer is certain time of sampling. So like at the beginning, we see one lineage and then we see two lineages. And if we sample like that, it seems to be, you know, like, okay, we have like two discrete lineages. So this is uh, also a physical space, right? In this example, it's a, it's a sympatric species here. It's everything is on one place. Then we can uh, imagine as 3D genetic space and we see in this area how the species is diverging, right? And there could be a lot of interactions in this space. 
And in the genetic phase, at the end, we see two discrete units. So we propose a probabilistic solution to the species, which should be universal. We call it Upsal. It is very nice because it also resembles the name of the university and that this is about all the cells. It's not like a new species concept, it's a new view on the species because, as I said, species concept finds discrete units. And it could be applicated to any domain of life because, uh, as I try to point out, that the most of the species, there is some gene flow which either cohere them or divide them. So it depends on the, on the situation. But there is a gene flow which is measurable somehow. And so the probability of divergence in the same time is the distance in this genetic space. So we could see that uh, the lineages, if they are speciating, they are diverging from each other in the space. So they are like further physically. And further they are, less gene flow they have. So then we can have like three basic phases of the divergence. So if there is like one species, the probability of divergence is, is zero. And there could be two fully diverged species when the probability of divergence is one. So they are like 100% diverged and they don't have any gene flow. But then there is a whole this area, which perhaps is even like most of the species are in this phase. We call it speciator, a synonym could be incipient species where the probability of divergence of those lineages is uh, variable. So it could be any between 0, well, 0 0.1 and 99.9. .9. And so this could allow us to work with the probability of those lineages and how diverged they are at a certain time point. If I go back to this Heliconius example, we could see that basically that the probability of backwards merging is uh, 70%. And when it was 70%, 2 million years ago, because there was, you know, less than 30% of genome in the gene flow. And then the 4.4% was gene flow. So it's reverse is 95.6. So in the present, we see only a little gene flow. So they are 95% diverge. And so it could be also visualized as a distance in the genetic space. So we don't need to work with species, full names of the discrete units, but to test of like evolutionary hypothesis, we could just say that these species are, or these lineages, I should better say, have likelihood of, I don't know, 70 or 90% of divergence. This could be applied to taxonomy, I don't know. I invite your uh, suggestions. We are thinking about that a lot, but I think that this concept take into account the continual way of speciation. That is a really good way, maybe not how to approach taxonomy, but how to approach species in all sorts of way of genetic, evolutionary and ecological research. So to conclude that, so I showed that most of the cyanobacterial genera are polyphyletic due to the convergence and that led to a boom of new genera. Taxonomic confusion is really huge in the gene bank, but maybe it will get better at some point. The cyanobacterial speciation seems to be driven by climate, geography and gene flow. And the species are considered as discrete units, but the speciations continue. So that's why we proposed Upsell. I have to thank to uh, many of my colleagues, especially Alexander Stanikovic and Svatokluskopi, who are my PhD students, then Alize Pouličková, she's uh, head of the lab. Remo Sargents, we work together a lot of on bioinformatic analysis, and my dear colleague Dale Kasemata from the University of North Florida, we worked a lot of on many, many, many papers. Then Eva Hodářová, she worked a lot on taxonomic questions and the diversity in gene bank, and then Honza Kolar, who developed the cell concept with me, and then Petra Schler and Franček Hindak were mentoring me in all sorts of taxonomic questions, and also a lot of foundations. And you for your attention. Thank you.